I will be moderating and presenting the paper in the middle, uh, work that Frank Shields and myself did. Frank is unable to attend, uh, but I will pass on any questions that I can't answer. Uh, we have two other speakers, uh, Wiley from IBI and Jeff Lick from UMass Boston and a colleague, and we're going to be looking at the issue of characterization. Now, we took all the content for this particular track and tried to parse it into some reasonable Areas. So there's some, some diversity involved, um, and really within characterization we have uh, the IBI focus, which is a certification and really a sort of a minimum standard and some downsize prevention. The shield is more like a, a partitioning of the basic fundamental properties, and then Jeff is getting into some exciting stuff uh, on making some blends and trying to predict in soil type performances. So I don't. I don't want to dominate. Um, there are three glasses of ice water up here for the three speakers. That's because if you go over, I'll just chuck the glass of ice water at you and slow you down. But I think the concept here is to be information exchange. We will be taking questions at the end of each speaker. We're not going to try to commingle the questions at the end. It gets too confusing and it becomes a popularity topic. So if you're Hearing something in the talk, let's hold it to the end and let's take a reasonable number of questions at the end and then hold any additional questions and the speakers will be available after the session, which leads into lunch. So you get access for the, the answers um, and I appreciate it. So I'm going to just sit down and just move along. We're going to use this hour and 20 minutes to our best. And I'd like to introduce uh, Wiley and I'm going to mispronounce your name by definition. <laughs> Wiley is what you're on to. So, and Hello, everyone. Good morning. Um, it's great to be here, and uh, thanks to the organizers and sponsors for putting this really great venue together and lots of activities and opportunities for networking and, uh, and sharing our stories and our thoughts on this issue. Uh, this is my first IBI conference, and so please do. Um, uh, come up and, and introduce yourself to me. I want to meet as many people as possible while I'm here and, and hear your stories and your issues. Um, my background is uh, really in the climate change field. I'm uh, an expert in the quantification of emissions from sources and removals by sinks of greenhouse gases, and I've worked on climate change policy for a number of years, um, starting with uh, work at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency's policy office on the lead up to the Kyoto Protocol. I've also worked in nonprofit and for profit entities that have been trying to um, advance the field of carbon offsets, high quality carbon offsets, the, our ability to measure those types of things. I've seen lots of different schemes and different strategies for, for mitigating climate change and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, oftentimes, these are characterized by a starting point of high emissions profile, and, but if we can bring in investments, uh, and, and find incentives from the financial sector, we can, we can emit less. Still emit, but we'll emit less. Now, I'm not saying this isn't a very, very necessary first step. We do need to start bringing down our emissions trajectory, but as those of you know who've been following climate change, that's not enough. We don't just need to start slowing down emissions. We need to finally rethink not only how we get to zero, but how do we do better than that? How do we actually pull carbon out of the atmosphere, um, prevent many of the unintended consequences of our fossil fuel habit. And when I first saw biochar, I mean, I, the, the, the thought that struck me was, wow, um, this is the real deal. And this is unlike a lot of other projects that I've seen and looked at and worked on and been part of the carbon market. Um, even the great forestry projects that I've had the pleasure of working on still have issues about how long will that carbon be sequestered uh, out of the very actively cycling biosphere and we look at biochar's promise to move this carbon from the atmosphere into a much slower cycling reservoir. Um, it really is exciting and, I, and I, uh, the energy and the passion of the folks in this room is, is it's really important and I, I, I share it and I, and I get it. I'm new to this field but um, I hope that we can all work together and, and in many cases uh, people that, uh, that share so many common views uh, and common goals and aspirations can also find themselves arguing vociferously and passionately. It certainly happens around my family around the dinner table. So I think that 
I'm sure we'll have disagreements over strategies and tactics, but um, my wish for this conference is that we don't lose sight of the fact that we're very much united by a common goal and a common effort to do the right thing, uh, promoting what is going to be, I think, a very essential wedge in, in climate mitigation as well as solving other important issues around food security. Um, so let me just jump in. Um, we, uh, thanks to Thayer, who gave a great introduction to IBI uh, at the plenary session. I won't go into a lot of this. We're here to support you. I mean, that's our goal and our, and our aspiration that we can help to foster uh, a network of researchers and policy analysts, commercial entities, stakeholders, small scale farmers, larger scale operations, uh, and promoting the development of sustainable biochar charge systems at all scales, uh, both in the US as well as internationally. We're really excited to do that, and we believe, of course, that this is not just about climate change, it's about enhancing food security and making agriculture more sustainable at all scales. And when we approach, as you had mentioned, this issue of characterization of biochar, we come at this very much from the point of view that it's essential at this early stage in this technology and this market development formation that we that we embrace standards. Standards are important for a variety of reasons. I mean, I think markets thrive best when products are clearly defined, categorized in a meaningful set of categories, and consistently manufactured. In order, I believe, in order for the biochar industry to succeed to its fullest potential, we need to be able to characterize biochar's essential properties to define and analyze and, and ultimately communicate to a wide variety of stakeholders and end users what biochar is and what it isn't. To do this, IBI created a standard and established a series of analytical test procedures that would be used to help confirm that the product possesses the necessary characteristics uh, and for safe use. And um, we can, there's always further characteristics that we go into, and I think some of the other panelists will try to do that. But this is really about improving product safety and building consumer confidence in, in the products. Um, the process of developing these standards, it's important just to go through. It's a, it was a large global, transparent, and, and, and fully documented process, and it was designed by, if you read, our former executive director, in a way that's consistent with the way that standards have been developed internationally for any number of different types of applications through the International Standards Organization and, and, and similar bodies try to do a uh, stakeholder engagement and, and outreach program process uh, throughout so that we bring in different, different types of views, work through where there are differences of opinion, and ultimately a voting process of experts um, to, to, to finalize the, the standard. Of course, this builds and relies upon a large body of uh, existing research and knowledge um, and looking for analogies in comparable standards development activities in other areas and the appropriate types of regulations and tests that we have. And throughout this process, many of you were involved in this. I think many of you in the room here have even voted on these standards. Um, so you know that your input was essential throughout this process. So we try to be as inclusive as, as possible. The, um, the actual standard is available on our website, and uh, as well as the program manual that describes the certification program that's built on the standard. The standard is called the Standardized Product Definition and Product Testing Guidelines for Biochar that's used in soil. And that's a long, a very descriptive title, but this typically referred to as just the I IBI Biochar Standards. And uh, these were developed and, and finalized and first published in 2012. They've recently been updated just in March of this year, and um, that process of continuing to improve and to revise these standards is ongoing. We will be making another technical revisions soon, uh, and I think that's just the logical and the normal pathway for these things. You, you, you go through this constant refinement and development and improvement process throughout, uh, and, and so your input and your feedback is uh, required and is essential for us to continue to improve these and make these as useful and as, as as valuable as possible to the, to the industry and to the stakeholders. Um, and our goal is that Biochar certifies through this program. Um, it, it, it's a very narrow but very clear, important uh, assessment of, of being able to pass certain element testing methods that are clearly defined in our standards, very, very detailed procedures, and, uh, prescriptive process so that there's no ambiguity, hopefully. In, in how the process works and, and what it takes to meet the standard. 
the goal again is to provide stakeholders and consumers with standardized and credible information on physical properties of products. In terms of the scope of the standard, I um, want to spend just a little bit of time uh, defining how this works. Um, this is a voluntary program, it's, it's built on self reporting, self, self, uh, self testing by biochar companies and manufacturers, and that information is provided to us. We go through an event review and ultimately hopefully certify the product. Um, at this time, the program is, is, is focused specifically on the product itself. It's a product testing and product certification. We're not, we're not certifying feedstock. We're not certifying pieces of technology or equipment or systems. Um, in fact, it's, it's open to many different types of technologies. You can use any technology production that, that, that you're looking at. Um, we're, also, we're also not certifying a blended product. We're certifying the biochar itself. And so, um, if, you're, if you're beginning to mix the biochar with other types of products, compost, or what have you, the, the testing needs to happen before that blending and mixing occurs. Um, right now, the program is uh, only open to manufacturers in the United States and in Canada. We, would, we, we intend to be able to expand this program to other geographic locations in other countries. Um, we certainly have some ongoing conversations about that um, as resources come in. It's not an easy and short process. It takes a lot of time. Um, a couple more things about this. Um, this standard is not, um, it's not a sustainability standard itself. I think it would support a sustainability standard. It's not an in-use guideline certifying the appropriate application of biochar for a specific Purpose or application other than using soil, and that's something that's biochar. We're not trying to match up a specific biochar for a specific cropping system. Um, the issues around sustainability are very, very important to us. We understand that we're going to have to continue to expand our work and, and, and do more to look at the full sustainability issues around <coughs> biochar production. And we have already started work on the biochar sustainability guidelines. Uh, there are there's information and principles available on our website. Uh, and that's an ongoing effort, and your participation in that um, is we can very much appreciate. These standards also do not um, do not address specifically the, the climate benefit. Um, the, we're not trying to quantify the, uh, the life cycle carbon avoided through this certification program. It's very very important to do that, but it's just outside the current scope of the, of the standard. And of course, the feedstock does have to be biomass. So we're only sort of trying this process. These types of certification programs um, are, are, are somewhat common. There's a variety of different examples or analogies that you could look to, to um, uh, in other places. Certainly, the um, Forest Stewardship Council has made great inroads in trying to help certify forests that have been you know, grown and harvested in a sustainable manner. Um, much of my early career in the 1990s and early 2000s was working in the renewable energy space where we were developing renewable energy certificates. You know, as a, he didn't robust debate about what's included in a renewable energy certificate. Does it include carbon benefits, for instance, and if so, how do you quantify that? Um, um, and I think that we're in a similar process today. I know that um, we've provided different views about how the certification standards uh, should be done and how they'll be applied, uh, but fundamentally this is about helping provide um, market maturity, um, assurances around product safety and end use, and certifications is way to address some of those concerns and I think healthy for the industry and healthy for growth in the industry. Um, the, the, within the U.S., the organic program is another great example. Three percent now, I think, of total food sales have been certified organic. It's 21 billion dollars in market value and market share is growing. So we see that this type of certification uh, has a real value and of course the U.S. composting seal of assurance uses similar types of testing requirements and sampling procedures that we have drawn from for our standard. Uh, and dozens of companies have registered under the, under the U.S. Composting uh, Council and I think it's about all of the states. Um, at the core of the standards process, which underlies our certification process, are, are, are tested by the product <coughs> itself. And we break these into three categories. Categories A and B are mandatory uh, for certification under our program. Um, and Test category C is optional. Category A is a test to look at the basic utility properties of, of, of biochar, 
and carbon content, nitrogen, pH, conductivity, and ash content are some of the categories. So all of this information is available to you on our website uh, and talk in more detail and laundry ability we have the time available today. Um, so for full detail, we can be happy to go into more of this with you. Um, this category B is the toxicant uh, analysis and reporting uh, requirement where we're testing biochar materials and even looking for uh, potential content of uh, toxicants and the concentrations of those and we have in the standard um, allowable levels of uh, contaminants in, in biomass. Um, those are established by looking at um, other regulatory requirements country by country as well as um, consulting our experts group and uh, and experts and researchers in the field. Um, and the test category C is an advanced analysis that's optional and that's getting more at the utility and the, and the qualities of uh, the biochar that might make it applicable and appropriate for different types of soil and activities and things like available phosphorus and mineral nitrogen content. So, so, so when we certify a product, it's it's a it's a requirement that you meet our standards. But also, if there is if you're in a jurisdiction that has additional requirements uh, and limits, then that also would be a, would, would apply, of course. So, why do we need to test the biochar for the presence of potential toxic compounds? I mean, certainly, if biochar is produced improperly, it could contain contaminants that are harmful to the health of the environment. And, and, and it's just that potential that we're addressing in this to provide, again, you know, sort of market surety um, and to help grow and shape and form uh, the rapidly growing market. Uh, there could be different pathways, of course, for contaminants to end up in biochar. Some, in some cases, there may be contaminants in feedstock that ultimately end up in the final product. Uh, and in other cases, there might be the potential for formation of toxic, toxic compounds within the production process itself. Heavy metals present in feedstocks, this, this, this could have detrimental effect on the product itself. And we get those to find out what exactly the line of the concentration. The process uh, we go through our certification program, uh, it's a five step process. Um, in a lot more detail on this, we can go into with you all, but I'll just give you a quick overview of that process. It starts off with uh, just registering with us online. There's a form you can go to and, all, and uh, register this. So biochar manufacturers uh, have begun to do this now. I'm happy to see uh, already the first few applicants working through our system. Um, once you do that, you're, you're by, by registering that you intend to go through the certification process, you're giving us a heads up that you're there. You're also you're sort of a grandfathering clause that you're locking yourself into that current version of the standards so that you don't suddenly have to um, meet any changes in the standard that might occur during the application process, you're locked in and you're, you're grandfathered in under what was uh, applicable at the time that you, that you registered with us. Uh, once that registration occurs, uh, we'd like you to get all the materials together and, and, and complete the application within two months, within 60 days. Um, once we have received a complete application, we'll do a review. If it's not complete, we'll tell you. We'll, we'll write you back a letter and tell you. Um, our goal is to complete our review in 10 days. Obviously, we just started this program, working through some, some kinks and issues come up sometimes that require us to go back to our board, go back to our expert group, consult from our legal advisors. So please bear with us. We may not be able to make it 10 days right now, but we're just getting this program started and, and I'm sure we'll be able to do that because we have more experience in doing so. Certification, once it's supposed to be completed, the process is good for one year. Um, recertification will be required. Um, Annually, uh, in most cases, if there's changes in your feedstock, um, you define exactly what you mean by a 10% change in feedstock materials. Um, that would require us to go through this process and make sure that the new feedstocks still meet this. So we can get them more. Um, there's a lot of benefits to this, obviously, and, and our goal is to support you, support manufacturers in this process, to help you differentiate your product um, and <coughs> inform end users of its essential characteristics. Um, again, we think the process by which we went through the development of the standards and engaged the expert group um, is inclusive. Uh, we didn't have 100% approval of these standards when the voting took place. 
Uh, we got over 90% in favor of supporting these standards and some of you voted for that. We appreciate that. And we're not done. We know that this process will go on and that we'll have to continue to refine the standard as uh, science dictates, as experience in the field, and how this implementation uh, process rolls out. Uh, so we're committed to doing that, working with you all to continue to make this uh, as valuable as possible. And that's that's the overview of how we approach the characterization of the final charm and how, how that's grounded in our standard and ultimately brought into into practice within the certification program. Stefan Jerk on our staff is our director of the certification program, and unfortunately he couldn't be here today. So you're stuck with me for the explanation of the program and I'd be happy to it sounds like we'll do we'll do questions one by one. So uh, thank you very much for your for your attention and um, I'm happy to answer questions. And, like about five minutes of questions, so let's take some time and then uh, Wiley will be available. So I can sit my water, I didn't get poured on this. So yeah, pretty good. Okay. okay, take that one off the table. Okay, <laughs> okay, I'll start at the front. Yes, sir. Yeah, how does the certification program work for research? Repacking? It's, it, it, okay, so the question was how does the certification program work in the case of a reseller or a repackager? Um, there is a central requirement that it's the manufacturer of the biochar that we need to talk to. One of the, one of the forms, for instance, that we require and submitted during this process is a chain of custody. So we, we really do need to know where the feedstocks originated and, and follow that through the production process. And then the sampling takes place before it's mixed or packaged and resold. So unfortunately, we need to have the manufacturer. Um, there's uh, sample labels on the in the program that you can look at, so you can see exactly how we'd like to, so it's how we need you to, 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 to include that on the product itself. Um, and again, that type of disclosure is something that we've looked at a lot of other analogies and similar technologies or similar fields. So does that answer your question? Okay, I'll just, I'm sorry, I'm not being totally fair. I'm just going to go from front to back, so I didn't see the order of the hands going up. So, yes, sir. <clears throat> I wonder if some help can be gotten by looking at. Uh, characterization problems in related fields. One of these is catalysis. And the efficiency of a catalyst depends upon things like surface area, force size distribution, and surface chemistry. Another area is in polymer reinforcement. For example, one adds carbon black to tires to reinforce it. And as you have said, all biotrash are not equal, but also all carbon blacks are not equal. And a given amount of carbon black reinforcing a rubber depend very much on the morphology of the carbon black. Well, we think similar considerations would be in order with regard to characterization of Well, they are. They, they definitely are. And, and again, our program is not um, trying to characterize all of the essential characteristics of biochar, but really to look at, at, at some of the issues around its essential characteristics and also um, to be able to identify if there is potentially a presence of, of, of undesirable toxins. We really need to characterize that. So it doesn't cover all of the different types of issues. Said some of these things we have been. So it's important. We'd like to believe that biochars are safe and effective, uh, but it's a good idea to make sure. That's the use of agriculture. Yes, agriculture. that's exactly right. Can you please repeat the question? Oh, I'm sorry, okay, yes. Um, um, but, um, but in the interest of time, I'll, I'll do that on the next one. Okay, so um, yes, sir. Just a quick one. I think it's a great program. We're a manufacturer. We're Going to certify. There's just one little point that didn't fit well with us, and that's that you require 10 percent of the product area to be your label. And I've mentioned this and found it to be dismissive on IBI. I don't know that's not really important. I'm not even sure my own label, the label, is going to be 10 percent package service. And it begins to look like an IBI product as opposed to product division. So I would ask you sincerely not to be dismissive on that point, but consider that maybe 10% of the total packing area is a bit too large on a product out there, and that you serve your own interests as well as the manufacturer's interest by taking it down to 5% or something that's a little bit more reasonable artistically. Uh, so, okay, very good. So the, the question and comment was that we do have requirements in terms of the way that the label uh, of the IBI certification is, is, is ultimately placed on the product, uh, and there's a size requirement, and I, you might have commented on this in the voting, I remember seeing a comment on this in the voting, 
So uh, the, 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 the issue or concern was maybe this is too large, maybe 10% is too large of an area. Um, and so we take your point well. Um, that is a requirement right now in the standard, and as I said, which is an ongoing process. It, um, we were very much basing the standard and the way we operate the certification program on the feedback that we get from manufacturers and from stakeholders and from our expert group. So that is an important consideration. We don't want to interfere with marketing activities. Um, and be happy to talk more about that. And I'm sorry, also, by the way, when you make a question, please just uh, state your name, sir, buddy. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Um, last question. OK, last question. I'm sorry, but please do, like I said, catch me in the hallway or, or any of the IBI staff here for more time. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, so the question was about um, our requirement that um, the feedstock going into the conversion process cannot vary by more than 10%, uh, and that a larger variation would require us to um, have to go back and recertify. And so the intent there was to make sure that throughout this process that we understand the chain of custody and where the material is coming from. And, and, and then how that ends up in the sample product that's, that's, that's done through testing. And our concern is that if there are large changes in feedstock, if suddenly in the middle of a year um, a completely different uh, product goes into biochar manufacture that we no longer know, and we can no longer assure end users that the product that we certified is still the product that's being sold using our label. So um, there are very uh, specific uh, examples in terms of how do you uh, you know, when does a 10% change in that feedstock uh, occur? Um, so, uh, you know, one example might be you're using a completely different type of feedstock, right? You, you started out with cellulosic uh, you know, feedstock, and all of a sudden now you're bringing in other types of agricultural waste. And, then, and, and so that would be a clear example. If that's more than 10% change, that we have to look like. Um, also, we, you know, we ask for the geographic location of the harvest. Uh, if it's a wood, if it's a wood product, or the geographic location of the agricultural residues, if that's the feedstock, um, and if those are changing dramatically, you know, or more than ten percent, then that again would require us to go back and, and, and look and make sure that we're satisfied that this is, this is still um, something that, that can bear for the certification. Um, so, yet we have to get into more details. But that's the, the, the general idea and the reason that we're trying to limit that feedstock change to no more than. Thanks very much. Thank you very much.